In this course, I'd like to show you some of what I've found useful in playing the alto saxophone. The saxophone is probably the most versatile of any acoustic instrument. You may want to play it like this. <laughs> Or you may want to play it like this. Or maybe you want to play it like this. Or you could want to play it like this. There's no one correct way to play. If I say to you something like, this is the proper way to play, what I really mean to say is, this is the way I found useful for me and the way that I play. Most of my playing has been in the fields of rock and roll, blues and pop music, but I always try to be versatile, learn bits of other styles like jazz, classical music, calypso, country and western, put it all together, come up with what's probably most important of all, your own style. Let the instrument become your voice. When you first get your saxophone, you'll find it comes in bits. The three main bits. This is the body. This is the neck or crook. And probably most important of all is this, the mouthpiece. We can make a sound on this by itself. Which we can't do with the rest of the saxophone. Now, the way the sound is made is quite scientific to explain, but the easiest way of imagining it is, you may remember when you were young, playing around with bits of grass and making a, a sound with them, putting it between your thumbs. Well, it's a very similar principle. We're blowing air across the grass or the reed. In the case of the saxophone, it's vibrating and making sound. Now, the mouthpiece may or may not come with a reed already on it. Whether it does or not, I'll show you how to put the reed onto the mouthpiece. This is the mouthpiece itself. This is called the ligature, which basically there's a little metal thing which clamps the reed onto the mouthpiece and the reed itself. The reeds are very fragile. You can very easily break the end of this reed. It, it tapers to a point. Um, you can break this by brushing against it with a sleeve, so be careful. Um, you'll see the reed has a, a flat side and a curved side. The mouthpiece has a flat bit there, which is called the table. The reed goes against this up onto it with the curved part of the reed corresponding to this curved part at the top of the mouthpiece. Now if you line it up so the reed is central on the table of the mouthpiece, the tip of the reed, when looked at it straight on like that, should come exactly to the tip of the mouthpiece. Now, very carefully Put the ligature over the top, like that, and tighten the screws. Now don't tighten them too tight or you will distort the reed. Just tight enough so that the reed won't move. Some ligatures, the screws are on the other side. It doesn't really matter, it doesn't make any difference. There are various different mechanisms. Some have a, a screw, one single screw coming down from the top. They all do the same thing. Right, the next thing to do is to put the mouthpiece onto the neck. There's a piece of cork here on the neck and the mouthpiece fits on there. Now, this should be quite a tight fit because it has to be airtight. If it's too hard to push on, you can use cork grease, which you can buy. It comes in a little lipstick shaped thing like this. Let's put a bit on the cork there and that'll make it easier for the mouthpiece to push on. Now, for now, we needn't worry exactly where it goes. The, the position 
of the mouthpiece will eventually determine whether the saxophone is in tune or not. But obviously until we've played a note, we don't know where the tuning position is. So for now, just push it on until you can feel a bit of resistance, but without having to push too hard. Next, we put the neck here into the top end of the body. Now line it up at the back so that this um, little bit of mechanism here, which is protruding at the top of the body, as you can see there when I take the neck off, is connecting to this part of the neck. That should be lined up in the middle of this curved shape bit there. When that's there, tighten the screw. Once again, you don't have to tighten it too tight or you could damage the instrument. And there we have the assembled saxophone. One other very important part of the saxophone is the strap, or sometimes known as the sling, because this is supporting the saxophone, in the, especially in the case of the alto. If you've got a soprano, it, it'll probably be a straight soprano and it doesn't need a strap, but the alto does. There, put, put the strap on the saxophone and then we're now ready to think about how to hold it. This is how to hold the saxophone when you're playing it. Now, firstly, the lower end of the saxophone at the back, you'll see a little bit of metal or it could be plastic sticking out there like that. You put your right thumb underneath that. Above that, the top end of the saxophone will be a button that you put your left thumb on. This button doesn't actually do anything at all, it's just somewhere to rest the thumb. There's a key just above it. For now, Ignore that, we don't want to press that key. We just put the thumb on that button. One very important thing now is to adjust the neck strap so that the mouthpiece goes to the right place. If it's too low, it will go into your neck. No use at all. If it's too high, poke your eye out and probably break the reed and your glasses. We adjust it so that the mouthpiece will fit comfortably the into your mouth. Just the very tip of the mouthpiece needs to go into the centre of your mouth. It's very important that the strap is taking the weight of the saxophone rather than your hands, because after a while if your hands are holding it like that, you're going to get very tired muscles here and you won't be able to play, play properly. With the mouthpiece ready to go into your mouth, we should hold the saxophone either to the right of the body or in front of it like that. There's no real rules about that because if you're performing you might want to be posing and play like that or like that. But for now we want to keep a straight back, stand comfortably, which will help us breathe properly. We could be sitting, in which case you'll find it's easiest with a saxophone to the right of the body. It's ra rather awkward having it in front like that when you're sitting. Before we actually blow the note, there's quite a complex thing going to be going on in your mouth. And the best way of describing this is to say, think of your lower lip like a cushion, which is going to go over the bottom teeth. Curl it over the teeth. And with your top teeth, imagine you're very slightly biting onto the top of the mouthpiece about a centimetre in from the edge. So the bottom lip slightly curled over the bottom teeth will be pressing against the, the reed top teeth on the top of the mouthpiece. Then with your tongue, tip of your tongue against the tip of the reed, we're going to blow. Now with, with the tip of your tongue on the reed, nothing's going to happen because you're blocking it off. But as soon as you move your tongue back off the reed, air will pass through this gap between the reed and the mouthpiece. The reed will vibrate and we should hear a note. When you want to finish playing the note, don't just take the mouthpiece out of your mouth. 
It might have looked like that's what I did, but in fact, I put my tongue back onto the edge of the reed, which stops the sound. Right, I'm going to show you how to play a few notes on the saxophone now. As I'm sitting down again, I shall be holding the saxophone to the right of my body. Now, the basic principle behind playing different notes on the saxophone is all the way down we have lots of holes in the saxophone which are open and closed by the use of keys. This is effectively changing the length of the tube of the instrument that is actually working. So as we press more keys down, we're making the tube longer and we get a lower note. The first note I'm going to show you is the note B. Now, you'll find all these keys on the saxophone look very complicated, but we don't have to really do too much messing around with our hands. There are three buttons at the, the bottom, which the right hand fingers will be going on, and three buttons at the top, which the left hand fingers will be playing. Now, to make things a little bit more complicated, there are actually more than three. There's a little button there in the middle, which we can ignore for now, and just above these three, there is an extra one which might be difficult to see on this saxophone because instead of being mother of pearl like the rest, it's brass. But on a lot of saxophones, this would look like another mother of pearl key. So if we count these three up from the bottom, one, two, ignore the little one, then the third one up is the one we want to press now. This is the B key. The first finger of the left hand will be playing this key. Now you don't have to press too hard at all, just as long as the pad closes. You, if you really force down on it, you'll be wasting an awful lot of energy and it'll slow your playing down. So, remember how we were holding the saxophone before, the right thumb underneath the thumb guard there, left thumb on the button at the back. Now this finger on that first button and mouthpiece in the mouth, tongue on the reed, say the syllable T and blow. Now, I'd just like to remind you about what we were doing with the mouth. Top teeth were on the top of the mouthpiece, and the lip was cushioning the bottom teeth, but actually applying a little bit of pressure there. Now, if you weren't able to get a note then, there could be several reasons. Um, you may have been blowing too hard or pinching, pushing too much with your jaw, which would be completely closing that, the reed against the mouthpiece and no air could get in. Or else maybe you weren't pressing hard enough and the reed wasn't vibrating. It could be that you haven't got a very good reed. Now this unfortunately is a problem with saxophones. You never know whether you're getting a good reed or a bad reed. You can sometimes tell by looking at it if it looks fairly symmetrical. It could be a good reed. If it looks warped or twisted, it's probably a bad reed and won't work. Best to buy several reeds at one time, then you can try them out. And a good tip is to soak them first before playing them. You can dip them in a glass of water for a minute or two or just soak it in your mouth. One possible problem, if you bought a second-hand saxophone, is the mouthpiece may be totally unsuitable for learning on, which could mean that it would be much too difficult to play if the gap between the reed and the mouthpiece is too big. Another thing that could be wrong is the saxophone itself may need overhauling or repairing. The only way of you really knowing this is to take it to a good repairer and they should tell you. Right, we'll just try playing that note again. This time I want you to, while you're playing it, concentrate on the note, that is, listen to it. The reason for this is I want you to think of this not as a purely mechanical process, but we're actually now playing music. Even though there's only one note, we want to think about that note as something beautiful. The only way you're ever going to get a beautiful sound, or a nasty sound if you want to get a nasty sound, whatever it is you want to get out of the saxophone, you've got to listen to it to end up getting the sound you want to get. So this time, play the note and concentrate on what you're hearing. Remember the tongue. Now, the best way of practicing your tone is to just play long notes, which is what we just did. 
And to me, this is always the most important part of any practice. If I don't get much time to practice, then at least I'll practice some long notes because I think this is so important, I can't say it enough. The sound of the saxophone, to me, is the most important part of it. Anyway, there's your note B. We'll uh, go on to playing a few more notes now. The next note, as we'll go down the instrument, is the note A. Now, to play the A, keeping the first finger on the B key, ignore the little button for now, and the next one down, we put the second finger of the left hand on there. Once again, don't press too hard, there's no need to. And this is the note A. <laughs> One more note while we're thinking about the left hand is the note G. The third finger of the left hand on the next button down. So we have the first three notes of the saxophone that I'm going to teach you, B, A and G. In this next section, we're going to look at breathing and articulation. I don't recommend that you play the saxophone with someone standing on your stomach. What I want to show you in this lesson is the importance, though, of the stomach muscles to breathing. Now, normally when we breathe, we don't think about it at all. It's something that comes naturally. But most people don't breathe using the lower part of their lungs or the diaphragm. Now, the diaphragm is the part of your body between the lungs and the abdomen and it's controlled by the muscles surrounding it. We can feel these muscles in our stomach. The reason we want to breathe like this is because playing a woodwind instrument we don't necessarily need a lot of air. What we need is to be able to control it and this way of breathing gives us a lot of control. Now a good way of thinking of this, instead of thinking you're breathing into your lungs, think that you're breathing into your stomach. Now here's an exercise you can do to practice diaphragm breathing. Place your hands on your stomach, fingers together. Now what we're going to do, as we breathe in, our stomach will be moving out. You can try and tense the muscles, if you like, to force the stomach out. As the stomach moves out and you breathe in, your fingers will separate. As you breathe out, your stomach will go in and your fingers will go together. Again, as you breathe in, stomach goes out, fingers separate, breathe out, stomach goes in, fingers together. This is something you can practice whenever you like, whenever you have five minutes break, coffee break, go off and practice diaphragm breathing. We're now going to look at tonguing, which I mentioned when we were producing the first note on the saxophone. Tonguing is very important. If you've ever heard a horn section that playing really tightly, that's because all the players are using their tongues at the same time together in a very precise way. Tonguing is also important because it allows you to start the note with a good strong sound. Instead of it just coming in weakly, if we start the note with our tongue, it means the gap between the reed and the mouthpiece is blocked off. We can build pressure up in our lungs using the diaphragm, take the tongue off the reed, and immediately the note starts nice and strong. It's like opening a tap hard. Eventually, we will want to, we will want to be able to tongue quickly, slowly, a good way of practicing this, even if you haven't got the saxophone, you can walk down the street going ta 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 or ta 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 if you like. Think of any rhythms, use this syllable ta. It's a very good practice.
In this next exercise, we're going to combine breathing, articulation and rhythm. I want you to tap your foot and at the same time mentally count one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four and so on. We're going to play the note B on the count of one. While still counting, we hold this note for four counts and stop on the next count of one. We're still counting, but during the next counts, we don't play at all. If you want to breathe, that's the time to breathe. If you don't need to breathe, you don't need to. Remember your tonguing and diaphragm at the same time. Try and keep your foot tapping regularly. If you want, you can use a metronome or a drum machine. Here we go. One, two, three, four, In musical terms, each of these counts, the one, two, three, four, etc., is called a beat. Beats are grouped into bars. In this case, there were four beats in each bar. Remember, we went one, two, three, four, and then started again. So we call this four, four. The notes we played, we call a whole note, or a semi-breathe. We're now going to do notes half the length. We call these half notes, or minims. There are two minims to each bar of four, four. Each note lasts two beats. So what we're going to do, we're mentally counting one, two, three, four, one, two, etc. But this time we start the first note on one as before. The second note we start on the count of three. We stop again on one of the next bar, rest for a bar, and then start again with the next bar, two notes to the bar this time. In musical notation it looks like this. One, two, three. Three, four. Two, three, four. Breathe if you need to. Two, three, four. Now, in this case, when we were playing one note going straight into the next one, you have to make sure that you're starting the first note with the tongue, ending it with the tongue, starting the second note with the tongue. Now those two actions of ending the first note and starting the second note should actually be one. The tongue flicks onto the reed and off again. Remember, ta 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 which we've been practicing walking down the street or during the coffee break. This is a next note. It's half along again, and it's called a quarter note or a crotchet. This time we're going to play two bars of notes and then rest. In written music, it looks like this. One, two, three, four. if you need to. Two, three, four. Right, this time we're going to play notes half as long again. We call these notes eighth notes or quavers and there are two notes to each count or beat. Here we go. In music, they look like this. One, two, three, four. 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 So far, we've been playing four beats to a bar. 
We call this the time signature of 4-4. You can see it at the beginning of the music, the two fours. This is the time signature. We're now going to do the same exercise with the time signature of 3-4. This time, tap your foot and count 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, and so on. We start the note on the first count of 1, hold it for 3, and stop on the next count of 1. Rest for 3, and then start again. In musical notation, it looks like this. 1, 2, 3. A dot following the written note means that that note lasts for half as long again. Remember, the half note lasted for two counts. Well, this is a dotted half note, and this lasts for three counts. It's very important that you get a sense of tempo. That means that your count is regular. It doesn't speed up or slow down. It's a very good exercise to try practicing with a metronome or a drum machine if you've got one. After a while, the sense of tempo will become natural to you. You shouldn't have to rely on tapping your foot either, but it doesn't do any harm if you want to tap your foot. I see no reason why you shouldn't. It's very important to play in a regular tempo when you're with other musicians, otherwise you could end up before them or after everyone else. We're now going to move on to the next section where I'm going to show you a few more notes and some tunes. Just before I teach you a couple of new notes and a scale and a few tunes, I want to discuss the aspect of tuning the saxophone. Okay, we've learnt the note B and we can play it quite well by now, I'm sure. But maybe your note doesn't sound quite the same as mine. This could be because it's not in tune. Now, the way we tune the saxophone is by moving the mouthpiece on or off the neck. If your note is higher in pitch than mine, that means it's sharp and we move the mouthpiece further off the neck like that. If your note was lower in pitch, then that means it's flat. We move the mouthpiece further on until it's in tune. You can also tune the saxophone to a piano. If you do this, your note B on the alto saxophone corresponds to the note D on the piano. OK, we've covered the notes G, A and B so far. Remember, this is the B, that's the A, and here's the G. G, A, B. The next note we're going to look at is C. Now this one's quite tricky. Instead of just taking a finger off and getting the next note upwards or putting a finger on and getting the next note down, we're going to have to alternate. That means to go from the B to the C, we take the finger off of the B at the same time putting the second finger of the left hand on that button there. That is the, the, the middle of these three buttons. Ignore the little one there. That's the C. B, C. Just try playing that. Now, alternating between B and C, like I said, is quite a tricky move. So practice going from one note to the other one. A very good exercise at this stage would be to use our previous rhythm exercise. Remember where we discussed quarter notes and we played the note B, four in a bar? We'll now try alternating between B and C, doing the same exercise. One, two, three, four. Okay, we're now going to look at the next note, which is the note D. This is possibly even trickier than the C because we're going to start using both hands and this is the lowest note of the upper register. Up to now we've been using the lower register of the saxophone, now we're going to use the octave key. To play this note we'll need all the fingers of the left hand that we've used so far, that's the same fingering as the G. And in addition to this, we're going to use three fingers of the right hand. This is the first, second and third finger, which go on these three buttons down here at the bottom end of the saxophone. One, two, three. 
So with those three fingers of the right hand, three fingers of the left hand, this is D. Not quite as simple as that. We have to add the octave key, which is this little mechanism just above the thumb rest. So with that pressed down, we're now ready to play the note D. Here it is. Now, it's quite tricky to go from the note C to the note D because we're changing from just one finger down of the left hand to three fingers of the left and three fingers of the right. And that's just one small step in music, C to D. So we're going to have to practice that move quite a lot just on its own. For now, play a C. Don't bother about counting or playing quarter notes for now. Just play the note C, then play the note D for as long as you like. Back to the note C. We're just going to try alternating. Don't worry about timing. But listen to the notes. Listen to the sound of the notes. Once you feel fairly confident changing between the two notes, then try doing it a bit quicker on the quarter note exercise. One, two, three, four. Okay, we now know the notes G, A, B, C and D. If we play them in that order, we have the first five notes of the scale of G major. So let's try going up this scale and then down it. G, A, B, C, and D. Now down. Now a little tip here. I want to talk about what you do with your fingers when you take them off the note. Now, it's very tempting to say, for instance, when you're going from the G to the A, you're taking the G finger off. When you're going from the A to the B, you're taking the B finger off. It can be very tempting to take those off a long way. Now, when I first started playing, I taught myself, I didn't know much about playing the saxophone, I made a big mistake of flapping my fingers all over the place, thinking a lot was going on. In fact, all that was happening is I was wasting a lot of energy and not playing any more notes. I got over this by gluing my fingers to the saxophone, which is quite a drastic remedy, which you won't have to do if you start from the very beginning with the good habit of just lifting your fingers as far as it needs to be. It can still be touching the button as they come off. It'll end up giving you a very much more economical technique. So just watch as we, as we play the scale of G again, see how the fingers don't move too far away from the buttons. Now, I don't expect you to play that fast. I just wanted to show you that you can play fast without a lot seeming to go on. This is a very economical way of playing and just shows you don't have to flap your fingers around all over the place. If you find you have to slow down at any point in this scale for a difficult bit, for instance between the C and the D, or the B and the C, what that means is you've started too fast. I want you to be able to play this scale at an even tempo. It doesn't matter how slow it is at all. In fact, the slower the better because you'll be playing strictly in time then. You won't have to slow down for the difficult bits. You can gradually speed up as you get to know it better. I don't mind how long it takes. It could be weeks or months or years. It really doesn't matter. Now that we know these five notes, G, A, B, C and D, we're going to try playing them in different combinations. Now instead of me giving you a series of exercises like a conventional teacher would do, I want you to make up your own exercises. You do this by playing those notes in any order you like. Pick the notes at random. If you like, write them down on a piece of paper and just choose B, C, A, D, D, B, G, A, could be whatever you like. In fact, see if you can find every single combination there are of those five notes and play them. What you're doing by this, as well as saving me giving you the exercises, is actually improvising. That is, making music up out of your own head. This is also called composing. This is a very important part of the kind of music I'm teaching you. It's involved in jazz, blues, rock and roll, 
and some sorts of classical music. Now, as well as improvising, I also think just as important as reading music is being able to play by ear. Now, that means you can hear a tune that's played by another musician or that you hear on a record, and you pick the notes out and work out what the tune is for yourself. We're going to try that now on a couple of tunes. The first one, we're going to give you the music as well. This is when the saints go marching in. You can play it with the five notes that we already know. We're going to be playing this to a backing track. And this tune starts on the second beat of the bar. Now this means I'm going to count you in two, three, four, one, and then you start on beat two. Okay, here we go. Two, three, four, one. <laughs> Okay, that was The Saints. Now, music should be fun, and we're beginning to have a bit of fun now playing a few tunes. You're also learning some very important things like reading music, improvising, articulation and breathing. I want to get a good balance between doing what I consider to be the correct technique and just having fun. This is what music's all about. Now, there are some more tunes I'm sure you can find for yourself that you can work out by ear to play with these five notes that we now know, G, A, B, C and D. One of them is Jingle Bells. I'm sure you all know this tune. It starts on the note B, so why not try working it out for yourself? If you want, there's a backing track for Jingle Bells that you'll find at the end of this video. Have fun. Up until now, I've asked you to tongue every note. Now, when you're playing two notes together, with no rests in between, we can play these in a style called legato. The first note is tongued as usual. Remember, tongue on the reed, then release it, play the note. But instead of tonguing the second or third note following that, just change your fingering while you're still blowing. In written music, this is indicated by a curved line called a slur. When we play like this, we refer to it as slurring the notes. I'm now going to slur between the notes B and C. Remember, tongue the first note, but not the ones after that. <laughs> Any number of notes can be played legato, as long as you remember to tongue the first one. Let's try it with G, A, B. Now B, C and D. Try it on your scale of G, G, A, B, C, D and back down to G. You'll probably find between the C and the D is particularly difficult legato. This is because we're changing from one register to the other. You've got to put all these fingers on. So practice just the C and D by itself if you're having trouble. Then go back to the scale until you can play it at an even tempo. You could try playing the tune we've learned, the Saints, legato. If, for instance, we group together the first lot of notes into one section of legato playing where we tongue the first one but not the rest, we've got what we call a phrase. Second group of notes do the same thing, we've got another phrase. This makes a very melodic style of playing. Instead of what we had previously was Right, we can use legato playing in any combination we like. We can group the notes into two, three, four, five, doesn't matter. 
What I want you to do is to try making up your own combinations of slurring and apply it to what we know so far. You can play the saints. Think about dividing it into different phrase lengths. You could play the whole thing maybe in one phrase. Or you could divide it into play three notes, tongue one, two notes, tongue two. Try different things out. Also, apply this to everything I've told you so far and all the exercises I give you in the future, whether I ask you to play them tongued or legato, try playing them different ways and with different combinations of phrasing. This is uh, all to do with what I said before about teaching yourself. Okay, have fun with it. I'm now going to show you a few more notes. In fact, I'm going to show you quite a lot of notes now so that very soon we'll be able to move on to playing some more interesting tunes and some blues tunes. First of all, we're going to continue further up the saxophone, the note E in the upper register. Remember the note D which we played with the left hand three fingers and the right hand three fingers? Well now, take off your right hand third finger and we have the note E. Now, take off the right hand second finger, we have the note F. Take off the right hand first finger, and we have G, which is the same as the lower octave G we learnt, but of course we've still got the octave mechanism down. This is the G in the upper register. So we've just learnt E, F and G. With these new notes, we can now play part of the C scale. That is C, D, E, F, and G. So let's try this. Now try it legato. Now, with these new notes, we could play Jingle Bells or The Saints in the key of C. I want you to just try doing this by ear. Jingle Bells starts in the note E, using the notes we've just learnt, C, D, E, F and G, we can play Jingle Bells. Sure you can make up the rest yourself. Or the saints, we would start on the notes C, E, F and G. Try playing the rest of it yourself. Now we're coming to the note F sharp. In the upper register, octave key on of course, play our G which is the first three fingers of the left hand and with the right hand we're going to play not to the first finger which would have been the F but the second finger this is the F sharp let's try this now with this note and the others we just learnt we're ready to play the entire G major scale the notes G A B C D which we learnt much earlier on than these new ones E, F sharp and G. So here's the G major scale. Try practicing that as I mentioned in the last lesson. Legato, try it with different combinations, group three notes with a slur and tongue with the fourth one, so on and so on. Now, note on the musical stave, there was a key signature there. The sharp sign means that when you come to a note on that line, it's an F sharp. This saves us writing the sharp sign every time we come to an F sharp. We're now going to try the note A in the upper register. This is very easy for you. You already know A in the lower register. All we do is add the octave key. 
Another way of practicing the G major scale, now that we know this extra A note, is to add that at the top and then come down. <laughs> This means we can play it up and down in a more flowing way, still keeping in 4-4. Now, note that the beginning and the end of that scale, we had what are called repeat signs. Now, this means when you get to the second repeat sign, you go back to the first repeat sign and play it over again. You could do this just once if there's no other indication, or if it says, for instance, times 3 or times 4, you would repeat it more than once. Now, try teaching yourself the notes B and C in the upper register, because you know them in the lower register, all you do is add the octave key. In the lower register, try the notes F sharp, F, E, and D. Right, just to recap, I want you to play all the notes we've learnt in the lower register, but then add the one an octave higher. It sounds like this. That was G. A, that was B, that was C. Now, the lower ones, G, going down to F sharp, to F, to E, and D. Now, getting quite low with that D, and it gets rather tricky to play the low notes on the saxophone, especially quietly. So that's a very good exercise to keep trying. Try and play the low notes quietly. G, A, B, C, upwards, and then G, F sharp, F, E, and D, downwards. Okay, now we know quite a lot of notes, so very soon we'll be getting on to some interesting tunes. The saxophone is capable of a vast range of expression. We could play a note and make it sound very nice and beautiful, or we could make it sound horrible and nasty, both of which are very useful things to be able to do. Here's a nice note. And here's a nasty one. Now both of those can be very useful ways of playing. We can express a wide range of emotions. What I'm going to do now is develop the long note exercise, which, as I told you before, I consider to be the most important exercise we're going to use. This is to make our playing more expressive. We'll start on a note that's in the middle of the range of the saxophone. B is a good note to start on, but I want you to play this on every note that you know. For now, I'm just going to concentrate on the B. You can go away and practice it on all the others. First of all, we're going to play the note B and concentrate on it being even. I want you to imagine the note like a straight line. Listen for tuning. Try and listen to see whether the note's going up or down in pitch. See if it sounds a bit lumpy, it got hiccups in it or something. Anyway, here we go, the straight note. <laughs> Now, for this exercise, we are going to be using a lot of control in our lower lip. As I said earlier, what we use for pressure on the reed is not our jaw, but it's the muscles that are supporting the lower lip. There's an exercise you can use to develop this lip, which you can do anywhere, whether you've got the saxophone or not. You can try this exercise walking down the street, in a restaurant, in a bar, whatever you like. You may even make some new friends doing it. What I want you to do is whistle and then smile and alternate this. This is very good for working on all these muscles around the mouth and this will develop your embouchure. This next exercise, we're going to play the long note again, but this time we keep it even, but we're going to change the loudness. What that means is we'll start quietly, the note's going to get louder, and then it's going to get quieter again. This is called dynamics. 
Again, listen to the note, make sure it doesn't go up or down in pitch. Try and make sure it's even, but concentrate on the sound. Try and make it sound as pleasant as you want it to sound. This next exercise, we're going to keep an even loudness, so we don't get any louder or quieter. Keep the note straight, but what we're going to do is relax the lower lip while we're playing it. This will make the note go flat. Yes, I'm asking you to play out of tune. But gradually relax this lip so that it gradually gets flatter and evenly gets flatter. And then bring the lip back up onto the reed so that it gets sharper and back in tune. You can imagine this like a wave. Like that. That's quite a difficult exercise and it gets harder as you get lower down. But don't worry, just persevere with it. What it'll do is three things. It'll give you flexibility to adjust your tuning. The saxophone as an instrument is not always perfectly in tune and some notes are inevitably slightly sharp or flat. By being able to relax your lower lip like this, you can adjust the tuning to fit in with what you hear around you. Some notes especially are quite difficult. Another reason for this exercise is learning flexibility so that you can bend notes. You can hear this style of playing in some of the great blues and jazz saxophone players such as Johnny Hodges who play things like this. Now the other reason for this exercise is vibrato. This is where the note wobbles slightly, for instance. Or. This can be a very expressive way of playing, and there are different kinds of vibrato. If you listen to different saxophone players, such as uh, Coleman Hawkins, on tenor or David Sanborn on the alto, you'll hear two very different types of vibrato. Some people think it's easy to do vibrato. Uh, what they're actually doing is the wrong sort. Now, it's very difficult to say what's right and wrong in saxophone technique, but what is easy is to do a kind of vibration in your throat, and it sounds like this. Which sounds very corny. And it's what a lot of players do when they start off and think they can play vibrato. It's completely uncontrolled. What we need to do is to be able to control this vibrato. The way we do this is by that very slow bending exercise where we think of the note like a wave. What we're doing is a very, very slowed down vibrato. Think of it like this wave, very, very slow. <laughs> And over a period of weeks, months, or years even, gradually speed it up. It's something that won't happen overnight. It's rather similar to the way drummers will practice a roll. They don't get their sticks and suddenly go... Dur -dur -dur -dur. They will go... Da, da, ma, ma, da, da, ma, ma. Very slow, and then gradually speed it up so that their roll is even and constant. It's the same with our vibrato. So this exercise could take you a long time, but it's worth it in the end. Now, we're going to try a tune where we can bend some notes in it. Before we do this, I'm going to have to show you a new note which is in this tune. This is the note of E flat. Now, to play the E flat, we use our D fingering, that is, the three fingers of the left hand, the first three fingers of the right hand, and the little finger of the right hand is going to be playing this key just here. See that? Side key. That's the E flat. Now, this note isn't in the key signature of this tune. But don't worry, we'll show you the note when it comes along. This is called an accidental. 
Bending notes shouldn't be overdone because it can become very annoying instead of interesting. In this lesson, we're going to learn a few more notes, a little bit of theory, some scales, and some arpeggios. Here's the first note. It's the B-flat. Now, to play the B-flat, we need the two fingers of our left hand. Remember, same as we're playing the A. Then add this side key here with the side of your first finger of the right hand. There's a group of three side keys down the right-hand side of the saxophone. It's the bottom one we're interested in here. The A fingering plus that side key there. This is the B flat. In the lower register. In the upper register. Now B flat is an interesting note because there are two alternative fingerings which I'll show you. You won't need them all at first, but I'll show you them now. Remember we've got this little button here on the left hand. This is the B-flat button, and we can play the B-flat using just the one finger, but two buttons. This is the first finger of the left hand, playing the first button, which is the B button, and then the little button, the B-flat, together. <laughs> Same as the other fingering I just showed you. Another fingering for B-flat, which I don't use very often, but it's still very useful in certain circumstances, is this one. Using your B key, the left hand, without playing any other notes of the left hand, you play the first finger of the right hand or the second finger of the right hand. This is it. Just for now, we're mainly going to be concentrating on the first one I showed you, which was the A fingering, adding this lower side key. We can now play a scale of G minor. This is a G harmonic minor scale. There are two types of minors, the harmonic and the melodic. For now, we're going to concentrate on the harmonic. To play this scale, we'll need the notes G, A, B flat, C, D, E flat, which I showed you in the last lesson, F sharp and the top G again. Starts on the lower G. <laughs> Now don't try and play that scale as fast as I played it just then to begin with. Play it in your own pace, nice and slowly and evenly. Try playing it as well, tonguing, legato, any combinations of those. Did you notice the key signature then? We had two flats, the B flat and the E flat. What this means is that every time there's a note B or E on the music, they're played flattened as a B flat or an E flat. Unless marked otherwise with what we call an accidental. An accidental is a sign that can apply to any note. In this case, we had one on the note F. 
what we had was an accidental sharpening the F. It could have been on any note, could be flattening a note if it's natural, or sharpening a note if it's a natural, could be making a sharp or a flat natural. It can apply to any note you want. I'm going to now show you the note G sharp. For this, we need the G fingering. We add the little finger of the left hand onto this key here. Can you see that? G, G sharp. This can also be called A flat. An A, when you flatten it, sounds very similar to a G when you sharpen it. The next one I'm going to show you is the C sharp or D flat. To play this, we don't need any fingers at all. Easy, isn't it? That was the C sharp or D flat. That is the top note of the lower register. Another very good thing to practice changing between the registers is to practice your C sharp to D. Now that we know these new notes, there are several more scales we can play. We've already covered the scale of G, so I'm going to show you some more ones which are F and A. Scale of F has one flat in it, that's a B flat. So the notes are F, G, A, B flat, C, D, E and F again. <laughs> Here is a scale of A. This one has three sharps in it, C sharp, F sharp and G sharp. The notes are A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, G sharp and A. The scale of C, I've already shown you half of it, that was the C, D, E, F, G. You can learn this one for yourself, the rest of it. Let's carry on up to the top C. We're now going to do some minor scales, firstly D minor. This is starting on the low D, we have D, E, F, G, A, B flat, C sharp, and then D in the upper register. <laughs> Scale of A minor has A, B, C, D, E, F, G sharp, and A. There are no sharps or flats in the key signature, but there is a G sharp, which is shown by what we call an accidental when you come to it. We're now going to learn some arpeggios. Arpeggios are going to become very useful in the next lesson, which is rock and roll and blues. This is a very good exercise for practicing your technique as well. Basically, an arpeggio is the first note, third note, and fifth note of each scale. We miss out the second and fourth. For instance, in the key of G, we play the G, which is the first note, miss out the A, which is the second note, and play the B, which is the third note. Miss out the C, the fourth note, and play the D. So it goes like this. G, B, D, B, G. Again. An arpeggio on F major would be F, miss out the G, 
play the A, miss out the B flat, and play the C. So that's F, A, C, and back down again, A and F. <laughs> I'd like you to work out for yourself the arpeggios on C and A. You know the scales, miss out the second and fourth notes. On the minor arpeggios, the same thing applies. You play the first note, the third note, and the fifth note of the scale. So on the G, we play G, B flat, and D, missing out the A and the C. <laughs> You can work out for yourself the minor arpeggios on D minor and A minor, now that you know the scales. One more scale I'm going to teach you is totally different to the majors and minors. This is called the chromatic scale. This scale uses every note available to us in Western music, all the sharps and flats, every note there is. It's quite tricky, so what we're going to do is break our rule about playing the scales evenly and slowly, because this is going to take you a long time to work out the fingerings going from one note to the next one in steps of what we call a semitone. That is the smallest interval in music that we have. The first semitone is between G to G sharp or A flat to A to A sharp or B flat to B to C to C sharp or D flat to D D sharp or E flat E F F sharp or G flat and then G. We're going to start this scale on the note G, go right up to the top C, back down to the bottom D, and then back up to G. You can start this scale, however, on whatever note you want, it doesn't matter. Now you may have to stop to breathe somewhere, so don't worry too much about playing it in even tempo. <laughs> Now that we've learnt all those scales and arpeggios, which I'm sure is going to take quite a long time to get used to, we're going to next look at some blues and rock and roll tunes. The blues is something that can't be taught. However, you can probably learn it. If you listen to some of the great rhythm and blues and rock and roll players, such as Earl Bostick, who plays alto, Lee Allen, King Curtis, great tenor players, some of these players can say as much with one note as a lot of flash technical players say with a thousand. Now, the important thing here is tone and flexibility. Remember, 
the long note exercise we had where we drop the pitch gradually and then bring it back up like a wave. Let's try that again. We're now going to look at a 12 bar blues chord sequence in the key of G. Now this is a very useful thing to look at because we'll get an idea of how we improvise on a chord sequence. The 12 bar blues chord sequence has been used in many different kinds of music, rhythm and blues, rock and roll, gospel, country and western, and modern pop music. It's also a good starting point for learning to improvise jazz. Although there are only three chords in this 12 bar blues, that's G, C, and D, and usually there are a lot more chords in jazz, it's very good to start at the beginning so we can train our ears to listen to the chord changes. In this case, we're going to play a tune that's based on what the bass player is playing, that is the bass line. This is a, a very common bass line, I'm sure you'll recognize it. We're going to adapt it slightly so that we can breathe. First of all, we're going to play quarter notes. That's on the first time round, called the first chorus. The second time round, that is the second chorus, we're going to play eight notes. This will give it a boogie-woogie flavor. The third time, I'm not going to play. You can play it for yourself, either the quarter notes or the eighth notes. Now, before we get on to this, remember the arpeggios we learned in the last lesson? G. That was the first note, the third note, and the fifth note of G. G, B, D, B, G. We're going to develop that a bit for the first chord and just add the sixth note and the seventh note of the G scale, which would normally be F sharp, except because this is the blues, we can take a few liberties and we're going to make that an F natural. This is called a blues note because we've flattened the note instead of playing the note that's normally in the major scale. So this is the first bit. <laughs> Sound familiar? The next chord in the sequence is C. So we do the same thing. We take the arpeggio of C, we play the first, the third, and the fifth notes. That's the C, the E, and the G. Then we're going to add the sixth and the flat and seventh. That's the A and the B flat. The third chord in this is the D chord, where we're going to use the D arpeggio, which I didn't show you, but you can work it out for yourself. Based on the D scale, we use the D, which is the first note, the F sharp, which is the third, the A, which is the fifth, then the B, the sixth, and the C, which is the seventh note, but flattened one. So instead of a C sharp, it's a C natural. <laughs> So we'll use those three patterns for the first chorus. Second chorus, we're going to play eighth notes, which means they'll sound like this. And so on. OK, you ready? Here comes the count. Okay, now we can transpose that chord sequence into whatever key 
we want to play the blues in. If we're playing it in C, we will use the chords that are based on the first, fourth and fifth notes of the C scale. So for instance, whereas in G we played the chords G, which is the first, C, which is the fourth, and D, which is the fifth note of the scale, in C we'd be playing C, which is the first note, F, which is the fourth note of the scale, and G, which is the fifth note of the scale. Changing the key of a tune is called transposing. The same structure applies to whatever key we're in. It's always chord one, chord four, and chord five. The next thing I'm going to show you about playing the blues is what we call the saxophone growl. You've probably heard players with a really rough tone. This is quite common in rock and roll. Some people find this easy, some people find it difficult. There's no real secret to it. All you do is hum or growl in your throat while you're playing. You don't have to hum the same note that you're playing. You'll find out by trial and error how this hum affects the note you're playing. <laughs> What I was doing in my throat then would sound something like this. Uh, pretty horrible, isn't it? But don't worry, no one's going to hear it. They're not going to turn around and think what a nerd you are because you're playing the saxophone at the same time and that's much louder. Plus, if there's a band playing, which there usually is, that will be a lot louder as well. The saxophone growl then sounds a bit like this. <laughs> Just on the end of that last lick I did, you might have noticed I played some notes going downwards. We call this a fall. Now, the way to do this is to play the chromatic scale and gradually get quieter. It's a bit of a difficult thing to explain. And it's very difficult to practice. You'll just have to listen to it, listen to players doing it, and try and work out how you gradually get quieter while fingering the chromatic scale downwards. Here it is again on the note A. <laughs> A good example of this you'll hear if you listen to the Pink Panther theme by Henry Mancini right at the end, the whole band do that for quite a long time. As I said before, in the blues we can sometimes take liberties with notes of the scale. For instance, we flattened the seventh note of the G scale in. Instead of playing an F sharp, we played an F natural. In the blues, we often flatten some of the notes, either the third, the fifth or the seventh. Now you don't have to do this, but do it some of the time, and at other times, don't flatten them. In effect, it's like playing a minor at the same time as playing in a major key. Usually the band will play in a major key. You'll be playing notes that apply to both major and minor. It gives it a kind of ambiguous feel, but it is basically in G major. There are other kinds of blues which are all in a minor, in which case the band will be playing in the minor and you're playing in the minor as well. It won't work the other way around, where the band plays in the minor and you can play in a major. It sounds horrible. The next tune we're going to do is going to be using quite a lot of blues notes, the flattened notes. This is in the key of G again. We'll be using the flattened third. So instead of B, we're playing B flat. Now remember, we can use alternate fingerings for the B flat. We can either use the A with the side key here, or we can use the B flat button key where our first finger of the left hand is holding down the B key and the little button key at the same time. In this tune, we're also going to introduce you to staccato. Now what that means is you play the note very short. In fact, the proper way of playing staccato is to play it exactly half the length. This is what you would be taught in classical music. In this case, we don't have to be quite so precise. Staccato is indicated in written music by a dot above or below the note, not to be confused with a dot after the note, which means you play the note half as long again. Pay special attention to this tune, dynamics. Remember, getting louder and getting quieter, that's what we're going to do in one part of this tune. And watch out, there are some accidentals in it, because that shows you that there are notes which aren't in the key signature. These are the blues notes. OK, here comes the count. One, two, three.
OK, I think you can work out for yourself which is the best of the B-flat fingerings to use in which part of that tune. There's a very good example there of slurring notes in groups of two. The bit just at the end that went... Now, this brings us to another point. When we're playing B to C and back to B again, we can use an alternative fingering for the C, which is much easier. What we do is play the B as normal with our first finger of the left hand. Now, the fingering for the C is to just bend with the side of your right hand, the side of your right hand finger, to play the second of this group of three side keys, like that. B, C, B. We're now going to play another blues tune. This one has a different feel. It's a sleazy kind of feel, this one. And it's in 12-8 time, which we haven't done yet. We've done 4-4 four, four, and we've talked about 3-4. Well, this one's in 12-8. There are four beats in the bar still, but this is slightly different because each beat is divided into three. This is called triple time. We can count it 1, 2, 3, 2, 2, 3, 3, 2, 3, 4, 2, 3. Now, we're going to show you the music. This may be getting quite advanced for you now. If you having trouble reading the music, learn the tune by ear. The tune starts on the fourth beat of the count. Something that is very useful when you're playing the blues is a scale which has evolved called the blues scale. This scale uses a lot of the notes that we use to make up blues licks and riffs. Now one of the hardest things to do is to play with a guitar player. The reason this is, is because guitarists like to play in the key of E. For us on the alto saxophone though, that's the key of C sharp, which is a pretty difficult key. What I'm going to do when I teach you the blues scale is to jump a few lessons and teach you the blues scale in our key of C sharp so that you can play with guitarists who always want to play in the key of E. Now, the first note you need is the C sharp. You know this one? Followed by E, F sharp, G natural, G sharp, B, and C sharp. Sounds like this. You can make up riffs and licks out of that very easily. In fact, most combinations of those notes will make quite good sounding blues licks. For the next example, we're going to use the blue scale of C sharp, followed by the blue scale of B. Now, for this one, we need the following notes. B, D, E, F natural, F sharp, A, and B. Likewise, we can make up riffs out of that very easily, which will fit against the chord of B. Now, what this next tune does is we have 16 bars of C sharp, followed by 16 bars of B, and ending with 16 bars of C-sharp. I'm going to play a phrase, then I'm going to leave a gap. In that gap, you can try and repeat the same phrase I played, read the music or play it by ear. 
Or if you want, in that gap, you can play a phrase which answers the phrase I played. This way we're playing a duet with each other. OK, here comes the count. One, two, three, four. Well, this is the end of our alto saxophone course. In the short amount of time available to us, I've shown you stuff that could take you between six months and several years to master. I'd like to have included everything you need to know, but that would be impossible. If there was something you didn't understand, rewind, try it over and over again. Go out, find books on the saxophone. Go to gigs, ask other saxophone players questions. I've shown you a lot of what I know. Other sax players will have different opinions. That's the nature of the instrument. Just keep practicing. Long notes, scales, reading music, playing by ear, inventing things. Some of this is hard work, some of it's fun. But you'll find it's worth it. Enjoy yourself. Thank you.